Hello there. Welcome to Just the Dis. We talk about Blu-rays here. And for this episode, I am going to be talking about the, I believe, October offerings from Imprint Films from Down Under in Australia. Uh, they are a division of Via Vision Entertainment. And I've talked about them a lot on the channel. I am definitely a fan of what they've been doing. Um, quite a batch of titles here for this round. Uh, and I'm going to start with what I believe is already probably going to be one of my favorite releases of 2021, uh, and that is this Harry Palmer collection. For those unfamiliar, of course, you can see Michael Caine plays the titular Harry Palmer. He is a British spy, uh, you know, kind of a, I don't know, not an antecedent or an, or some kind of a an answer to James Bond, he's different. He's a different kind of character. In fact, it's interesting that they have him on the cover not wearing glasses because I find that to be one of the very visually defining characteristics of Harry Palmer is that he wears glasses. And I kind of love that. I just think it's there's just something very simple about that difference between James Bond and, and Harry Palmer. And Palmer is also just like a little more of a working class type, you know, uh, borderline criminal type. They say he has criminal tendencies in one of the early parts of uh, The Ipcris File, which is the first of the three films here. Now, these films have been available on Blu-ray in and other formats for years. Well, not years, but uh, some of them have come out recently on Blu-ray. But uh, this set is really unique and pretty fantastic in that they have ported over some of the features from previous releases, they have some really nice new features, and all three films are included in this set. All three films are from different studios, so, you know, I know we've seen box sets like this before where, you know, uh, the Halloween set, you know, Scream Factory pulls together a bunch of different studio releases for that. Same thing with the Friday the 13th set. Um, but that is an, e an easy thing to do, and I think people think, you know, it's just a matter of snapping the fingers and and the rights holders will easily um, allow you to do whatever you like. It's not always that simple. And so to put this box together um, couldn't have been uh, a snap of the fingers, and I'm very happy that they went through the effort of putting all three films together in this set. Um, so let, what do we have? We have, of course, a beautiful imprint box set. I love the, the thick stock that they use for the box sets. I'm a big fan of the imprint boxes and uh, we'll pull out the films here. So we'll start with the Ipcris file. This is the best of the three in my opinion and my favorite and introduces us to the character of Harry Palmer. Um, there's a good picture of Harry in all his glory. Uh, and yeah, this is a uh, you know, just the story of, like I said, a much more sort of working class spy. And uh, Harry is just a fascinating character. He's, you know, very insubordinate, uh, doesn't really give a lot of respect to his superiors. And in this one, he is assigned the job of investigating um, worries over British security. Um, and it's sort of drops him into this, you know, new world of intrigue. Um, you know, it's, you know, double dealing, kidnap, murder, uh, when he sort of finds a traitor operating in the heart of the Secret Service. And yeah, this is just a fantastic movie, a beautiful score by John Barry. Uh, so you have a direct line to James Bond there. Um, but yeah, I just love this movie. I love the character. I think Kane, you know, in one of his best performances, just really nails this guy, really just makes him iconic. And yeah, I just love this movie. I, I don't know what to tell you. It's just a beautiful spy film and has some like cool, intense moments in it, moments of um, attempted brainwashing and you know, people dealing with that kind of um, persuasive technique. And yeah, it's just a great thriller. Uh, again, I don't know if I mentioned, directed by Sidney J. Fury, a very good uh, director that I'm a fan of. And uh, based on the novel by Len Dayton. 
I think it was a series of books uh, by Dayton. And okay, so here we have all the features on this one. And it's like I said, it's sort of packed. So you have a uh, 1080p master from restored 2K scan by ITV Studios. ITV put it out on Blu-ray a while back. Uh, but I believe they're porting over some of those features. So you have audio commentary with director Sidney J. Fury and film editor Peter Hunt. Peter Hunt, of course, an editor on the Bond films and going to, I believe, direct some Bond films. So you have more Bond connections there. New audio commentary uh, with film historian Troy Holworth and film historian filmmaker Daniel Kramer. Uh, Michael Caine is Harry Palmer, an interview with Michael Caine from 2006 where he talks about the character. And he has some really great stories in that interview, just talking about like how he got the part. Um, Harry Saltzman produced the film. Harry Saltzman, along with Cubby Broccoli, produced the Bond films. And so he was like a really big deal. And Kane has this great story he tells about going to lunch with his then best friend, Terrence Stamp, and seeing that, uh, you know, Harry Saltzman showed up in the restaurant and Harry Saltzman sent him a note, you know, do you want to get coffee? And he was just, you know, a young actor. I think he'd only done maybe like Zulu and if not too many films at that point. He wasn't the phenomenon, Michael Caine, certainly. And so, of course, Michael Caine says yes. He goes and gets coffee with with Harry Saltzman. And Harry offers him a job, offers him a seven-year contract. And, you know, away he goes with his career. So, you know, just one of those great stories of, a, of an actor already working, but certainly getting a big break, which I think if you read enough stories about Hollywood, you know that a lot of what, the most successful people run into is a spot of great luck. And that was certainly Michael Caine's spot of great luck. So anyway, it's a really great interview with him. Uh, Then you have an interview with um, production designer Ken Adam, locations report with uh, Richard uh, Docker, through the key hole interview with second assistant director Dennis Johnson Jr. That's new. Counting the cash interview with assistant production accountant Maurice Landsberger, also new. Um the trailers, radio spots, etc. Uh, but a good looking transfer and just a really nice version of this film with some good extras. So I'm very pleased with this. And then of course we get the other two films as well. Um, oops. Next up is Funeral in Berlin. So uh, I should say that uh, Ipcris File 1965 and then uh, Funeral in Berlin, 1966. I love the artwork that Imprint chooses for their discs. They always pick uh, good artwork for both their slip covers and their boxes, and they just really, they really figured it out. And I do like, as much as I like a reversible cover, I also like the, you know, inside artwork thing that they do with these. That's just kind of cool to me. And of course, I've always mentioned the year on the side, you know, and, and the number on the side as well. Um, so what we have here is Michael Caine again, returning with, uh, you know, his character, the great Harry Palmer. And he, uh, this one is directed by Guy Hamilton, who would actually go on to make a few Bond films. I want to say like, I'm going to misspeak, but maybe like three or four, um, in this one, uh, a Soviet officer responsible for cure- security at the Berlin Wall wants to, or appears to want to defect, but there's evidence that maybe he doesn't, and he wants the British to handle his defection and ask for one of their agents, of course, Harry Palmer, to smuggle him out of East Germany. So that's kind of the plot, loosely, of this one, a uh, little Cold War stuff. And uh, I like this one a good deal, too. I mean, they're all good, because I think... Again, Kane is so iconic as this character that he just really stands out and, uh, you know, just makes these movies so memorable. And if you're a James Bond fan and you haven't seen these, I'm not saying you'll like him as much as you like James Bond. He's much more low key in a lot of ways. Uh, But, you know, nonetheless, I just think, you know, if you're a fan of, you know, spy films, British spy films, you got to check out Harry Palmer. It's just a, a character that you will likely very much enjoy. And knowing the popularity of James Bond and even having 
just gotten a new Bond film this year. I just feel like people are always open to uh, Bond type characters, even if they're a little different like this. Um, but anyway, I like Funeral in Berlin. Good movie. This one has uh, audio commentary by Rob Mallows of the Dayton Dossier, which is, I believe, a website all about Len Dayton. Uh, Fun in Berlin, an interview with editor John Bloom. Afternoon Plus, an interview with Len Dayton himself. It's like a TV interview from 1983. Very interesting in that <laughs> it starts as sort of a regular, like he's talking to him about the Ipcris file and the books. And then it's sort of, it's one of those very... I've seen this in a few, not just British interviews, but certainly British television interviews where the um, interviewer is kind of aggressive, you know, in terms of his challenging of the subject. And uh, so he starts asking about his views on education and his upbringing and his views on class. And so it diverts into a a bit more of a political conversation in an interesting way, um, but becomes less about the... um, the books and the character. But that said, still fascinating to see Len Dayton himself talking about the character, even for a short time. Uh, and then uh, Michael Caine, Breaking the Mold, a documentary all about Michael Caine, where they talk to, um, you know, a bunch of different people, including actors. Um, I think Roger Moore is in there and Bob Hoskins is in there. And so there's a lot of people talking about Caine and what he did in terms of where he came from. And anyway, Really great, uh, inter- you know, documentary. You're getting a documentary on that one. And then we have Billion Dollar Brain, which is by far the, I guess, maybe the most out there of the three uh, films. And of course, as you can see, it's, uh, again, produced by Harry Salzman. But um, this one's directed by Ken Russell. Yes, that Ken Russell. And uh, it's one of those things where it's just got some trippy stuff to it and it's got, you know, Carl Malden and Ed Bagley and it has a plot about, uh, the plot to sort of overthrow communism with the help of a supercomputer. So definitely some stuff that we will begin to see, you know, later, uh, in some other films, but it's, it's pretty, it's pretty nuts. Um, not super bonkers, but just kind of, Oh, Susan George is in this too. I forgot about that. Um, but I dig this one as well, again, just because of the character and because I like Ken Russell, actually. This one's from 1967, so you have three years in a row with films uh, with Harry Palmer. And um, yeah, this one is good stuff and also has some good features, as you can see here. Uh, we have the um, an audio commentary with film historians Vic Pratt and Will Fowler, Interview with Rob Mallows of the Dayton Dossier, the guy who does the commentary on the previous disc. Um, then you have, uh, let's see, Photographing Spies, Interview with Cinematographer Billy Williams, Billion Dollar Frame, Interview with Associate uh, Editor Will uh, Kemplin, and this week an excerpt of Michael Kane discussing the British film industry. Um, I think I... I kind of over overlooked here, so I mentioned um, uh, Michael Caine breaking the mold documentary. That's that's about an hour long, but I forgot to mention the Candid Kane, a self portrait by Michael Caine, a TV documentary. I want to say that's about forty five minutes, and that's really great. That's like him kind of going through. I, I want to say he's around the time of filming Ipcris. Uh, I guess not. It's sixty nine. So, but you know, he's just talking about celebrities, talking about acting, he's talking about himself where he came from and I really liked that one and might be one of my favorite features in all these this the the candid cane so I, I can't believe I overlooked that but um, so that's all to say this set is really really special and um, I highly highly recommend it so that's the Harry Palmer collection and then we have uh, some singles here this one kind of goes with the harry palmer and this one is the assassin bureau sorry the assassination bureau limited uh i say limited because that is something that is noted by uh by kim newman in the interviews that he does on this disc which i'll get to in a second but um this movie is directed by basil dearden who's a great british director who did a ton of good stuff i can't remember if i've i think i've talked about um 
Pool of London on here. That's a great noir that he did, but he just did a ton of movies. Uh, and this is one that has sort of a cult following in part because of the cast. You have Oliver Reed, you have Diana Rigg um, from the Avengers, of course, who just passed recently. Telly Savalas, Kurt Jurgens, Philip Noir, Noiré, um, Beryl Reed. It's, it's a really great cast. And the idea is that this bureau has existed for decades, perhaps centuries, uh, until Diana Riggs' character begins to investigate it. Um, and the high moral standing of the Bureau only killing those who deserve to be killed is called into question by her. Uh, but it's sort of like a secret society kind of thing, you know. Um, she puts out a contract for the Bureau to assassinate its leader on the eve of World War One, and sort of rolls from there. But it's a fascinating film. The back says... Uh, a comprehensive service a comprehensive service is offered by the assassination bureau limited no social or political bias just murder as fine as a fine art when determined uh, young reporter cheekily names the bureau's chairman ivan dragomilov as her victim he accepts her commission as a means to revitalize his flagging organization so i, I there's a, you know there's a satirical aspect to this and uh, it's just one of those movies that's a real cult item. Um, and this is, I want to say, the first time I've seen it on Blu-ray. Um, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, it has an audio commentary by film historian Kevin Lyons. Uh, Kim Newman talks for about 15 minutes. And I always love the Kim Newman chats. It's just him by his bookcase, usually wearing a vest uh, and a bow tie. And um, sometimes he'll change the books that are behind him. He'll put a book up that you know, relates to the topic at hand. And I think that's adorable. Um, and yeah, he's just got a lot to say about it. He loves this movie. He says it's been ripped off a lot, including by him in some of his Anno Dracula books. Uh, but he talks about like uh, comic books like Kingsman Secret Service and people like Alan Moore or something that, you know, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, things like that, that are clearly uh, heavily influenced by the Assassination Bureau. So it's just one of those movies that, despite, as he says, its uh, lack of a huge public footprint or something along those lines, for, for a movie that's not that well-known, it is oft uh, you know, referenced, oft stolen from. And I think it's neat that it's finally getting a nice release. Uh, then you have a really nice uh, tribute to Diana Rigg, a visual essay by the great Cat Ellinger included here as well. Um, so this one is a beauty. Again, I love the artwork. So you have your slip and then you have this great artwork on the cover. And then of course you have your internal artwork. You have, um, I'll read in Diana Rigg, but yeah, this one, this one is cool. It's a good movie. And one that I think I found through guide for the film fanatic years ago, maybe it was in the, it had sort of a cult movie listing or something. Um, and speaking of cult movies, next up I have Reflection of Fear, this one uh, from 72. I should have mentioned that um, this is from 1969, just to give you, you know, historical context for it. So um, 1972, starring Sandra Locke, uh, it's, it's a really interesting and atmospheric um, proto-giallo, proto-slasher kind of energy. Um, has some other stuff going on that I think is really fascinating. Uh, it's uh, like this young girl that lives with her mother and grandmother um, near the ocean. Uh, and one day her estranged father returns home with a female companion he introduce, introduces as his fiance. And soon the girl finds herself in the midst of strange goings on, which in evolve into a web of crime and murder. But the setup is really interesting because the... Um, Sandra Locke character is a little strange, you know, like she sits in a room, uh, by herself with dolls that talk to her. She has sort of a trans aspect to her personality that she has killed, I guess. And I, I, okay, I don't want to get too deep into this, but there's definitely stuff of her talking to dolls, her hearing doll voices. It'll remind you of something like magic, you know, from way back. And, um, so it's just one of those movies that's just got a really interesting atmosphere. I think Sandra Locke, as an actor, did so many interesting films. Uh, you think about things like 
the gaunt, you know, the gauntlet with Clint Eastwood or every which way, but loose any which way you can or whichever one she's in. Um, and then, you know, rat boy and just like lots of fascinating stuff. And this is one of those movies that really stands out as an interesting psychological examination and an, you know, edge of horror kind of horror film. Um, so that's your artwork for the box. And then here's the, uh, Blu-ray artwork. And then uh, it has an audio commentary by uh, author critic Lee Gambin. And then an interview, audio from an interview he did with Sandra Locke and actor uh, Gordon Duvall. Um, I, I believe those are separate recordings, but he, or I'm sorry, um, I, for, I forget if he's moderating both or just the second one. But regardless, you have some actual audio of Sandra Locke talking about this film, which is very cool. Uh, and yeah, this is just one of those I feel like is not real well known. And I think that's one of the cool things that Imprint's been doing is digging up these lesser seen movies. And uh, so that's a reflection of fear. They're also doing cool stuff like this where they have um, uh, the Browning version, which has had multiple versions. And they have two versions of the film included in this box set. Okay. Um, so you have the original 1951 version of the Browning version. And the back says, despised by his wife, feared by his pupils, a man without friends. This is the lonely schoolmaster whose story brilliantly told by Terrence Radigan comes to the screen with all the artistry of Michael Redgrave, John Kent, and Nigel Patrick. Um, and so, yeah, so you have this version from then, and then you have a 1994 version with uh, Albert Finney playing the title role uh, and also starring uh, Greta Sacchi and Matthew Mo Modine. And I have not seen this film in either version, though I have heard of it. Um, and so I've always been curious about this. I'm a big Albert Finney fan. And, you know, this one um, talks about um, how the this the, the letterbox thing says, you know, uh, he is forced from his position as the classics master in English public school due to poor health. As he winds up his final term, he discovers not only that his wife, Millie, has been unfaithful to him with one of his fellow schoolmasters, but the school students and faculty have long hated him. However, an unexpected act of kindness causes Crocker Harris to reevaluate his life's work. And so, yeah, so it's just sort of um, that kind of a story. And, uh, yeah, I'm just fascinated by the idea of including multiple versions of a film you know, together in a set. So you can observe both. You can see they, you know, are both from the novel by Radigan, uh, but they are, you know, 40 years apart almost, you know, like, so it's one of those things where you get to see the differences in both uh, technique and, you know, act in terms of the filmmaking and then the acting and, and just two films made 40 years apart. There's just going to be some differences there. So I think that's really cool stuff. Um, oh, I should talk about the features. Um, this one is uh, high def two, from a 2K scan, audio commentary by film historians Joe Bodding and, Bodding and Melanie Williams and Matthew Sweet on the Browning version. And then this version it has an audio uh, commentary by film critic Peter Tungette, audio interview with Albert Finney biographer Gabriel Hirschman, and The Art of Learning, the Browning version, interview with composer Mark Isham, who I'm a big fan of Isham. I like him as a, a composer. Uh, no less and certainly no more Matthew Modine on the Browning version. So you talk about uh, that him as an actor talking about his experience on the film and the Guardian archival interview with Mike Figgis, who directed this version of the film. And the first version, of course, directed by Anthony Asquith. So anyway, that's a nice little box set. And I again, I do appreciate that. And you just don't see companies doing that too much again because i think it's often complicated in terms of rights you know which studio made this and you know how hard would it be to get those rights and anyway so next up we have ned kelly this is a really interesting western um based on the life of famed 19th century australian outlaw ned kelly and it of course stars mick jagger who didn't act in a ton of films but the ones he did act in, I find absolutely um, compelling. And his performance in performance is truly, truly um, outstanding. 
and he's equally interesting here. Uh, the sort of plot of this movie is that it sort of sets up the character, a guy who's sort of unable to support his family in the Australian outback, and he ends up turning to stealing horses in order to make money, and then he sort of gets more deeply drawn into the outlaw life and eventually becomes involved in murders, and it kind of goes from there. But um, yeah, it's it's a you know it's an interesting movie, certainly as a western and a uh, an example of Mick Jagger's acting. If you're a fan of his music, I think you should check out his acting because I I do think it's really interesting stuff. And so this one, there's your cover. And there's the artwork. Again, I really love these artwork choices. I just think that's a really great piece of artwork they've chosen there. Um, and then this one has an audio commentary with film scholar Adrian Martin and shooting a Rolling Stone featurette. Both are brand new. Um, I think this has gotten a, a release somewhere else. But again, I'm finding that the imprint, vil- even where films have been released, the imprint version always impresses me. So they end up, like for instance, Shout Factory put out The Awakening with Charlton Heston, and so did Imprint. But Imprint's version, I thought, was better. And I'm finding that being the case more often than not. So... For this one, uh, again, for folks that want to check out some Mick Jagger action. And then lastly, we have this big old British comedy box set. Big screen British comedy. And what that's referring to is that these are all uh, based on British television shows. And this is stuff I'm completely unfamiliar with outside of In Name Only. And uh, Are You Being Served is the only one that I really know. So it's definitely a cultural thing in terms of... I know a lot of folks from overseas definitely are aware of these. You know, a lot of them, I think they're all sitcoms um, that these movies are based on and have a fondness for them and have uh, um, nostalgia for the films as well. But again, I love the curation of this set you know and it's definitely one that I know folks uh, in the UK and Australia will totally appreciate and will be maybe less known to folks uh, in the US but that said I still think that uh, this is the kind of set that will help you discover new movies Um, so we'll start with Dad's Army which um, you know it's a 71 feature film based on the BBC the BBC TV sitcom. Um, it was filmed between series three and four and was based upon material from early episodes of the show, apparently. And the film told uh, the story of the Home Guards platoon formation and their sub- subsequent uh, endeavors at a training exercise. So you can kind of see the potential for comedy there. And, uh, you know, the cast includes Arthur Lowe, John Le Messurier, Clive Dunn. John Laurie, James Beck, Arthur, uh, Arnold Ridley. And yeah, so I will be checking all of these out, but that's the first one. And um, yeah, so let me just go through the extras as I go here, just so I don't forget. So this one has um, 1080p high definition transfer presented in its original as exhibited aspect ratio. Audio commentary by Tony Pritchard and Paul Carpenter of the Dad's Army Appreciationist Society. Frank Williams on Dad's Army. Uh, Walmington on sc- screen. Uh, interview with editor Wally Kemplin. Arthur Lowe radio interview extract from 76. Open house and interview with writer Jimmy Perry and actor Bill Pertwee from 1998. Uh, Pelican Crossing, uh, two 1970s road safety films featuring the Dad's Army cast. Don't Panic, a 1970s road safety film featuring actor Clive Dunn and locations and photo gallery. So, I mean, they've really gone out of their way to put together this package of extras, which I would I would put them akin with something like Indicator, where they're grabbing old interviews, new stu- making new stuff, and really putting together a nice comprehensive package. So here we have Steptoe and Son. This one is from 1972, uh, also a British sitcom, which has a sequel. 
Uh, and it says Albert Steptoe and his son, Harold, are junk dealers. Um, and it obviously sounds a lot like Stepford and Son, uh, which, you know, I'm sure is probably based, based on that this show. Who knows? Um, complete with a horse and cart to tour the neighborhood. They also live amicably, amicably together at the junkyard. But Harold, who likes the bright lights in the West End of London, meets a stripper, marries her, and takes her home. Albert, of course, is furious and tries every trick he knows to drive the new bride from his household. So you've got your setup there. Um, and the cast includes Wilfred Bramble, Harry H. Corbett, Carolyn Seymour, Arthur Howard, Victor Madden, Fred Griffiths, etc. Um, so that's this film. And I'll talk about the sequel, which is also included in just one second. But with this one, you get audio commentary by television historian Dick Fitty. Interview with Harry H. Corbett from Today, and that's back in 1975. Interview with Ray Galton and Alan Simpson from 2013. Uh, and uh, this has a booklet, which is a it's got a it's a reproduction of the press booklet, which is also a really cool feature. And I don't think too many um, imprint films have done that so far. So that's a nice extra to have for that. And so then we have Steps <laughs> Steptoe and Sun Ride again. I kind of love the old sequel trope of calling your sequel Ride Again or Rides Again. Um, in this one, it says, um, th they, uh, it says, always on the lookout t for ways to improve his lot. Harold invests his father's life savings in a greyhound who is almost blind and can't see the hare. When the dog race loses the race and Harold uh, has to pay off the debt, he comes up with another bright idea. Uh, collect his father's life insurance. To do this, his father must pretend to be dead. So you see the setup. These are very sitcom-y setups, you know, um, but I do like that they're, you know, playing them out in a feature format. And if you like these actors and these characters, why not, you know? Definitely enjoyable to watch. So this one includes audio commentary by comedy historian Robert Ross and Gemma Fanning, on-set interview excerpts from BBC's Nationwide from 1973, Comedy Makers, uh, excerpt from 1970s Dutch television featuring rehearsal footage from Steptoe and Son episode Men of Property, an interview with Ray Galton and Alan Simpson. And Stepso, Steptoe and Son Down Under, uh, album recording from Australia Stage Show from 1977. So they're just really, and you have an isolated music uh, and effects audio track as well. Um, so they've really just outdone themselves in terms of this set. This is really going to please fans of these shows. So then you have, of course, Are You Being Served? Um, in my mind, one of the most famous of the shows in this set. And this one, of course, um, if I'm just reading off of, let's say, Letterbox, says the closing clothing department's floor requires renovation. Rather than let the staff sit idle while the area is closed, the management sends them on a paid holiday in Costa Planca, a fictional city in Spain. Their hotel and its surroundings prove to be dismal, and the group tries to pass the time by acting on the crushes they have developed for one another in the workplace. This results in disaster as multiple amorous notes reach the wrong recipients and everyone gets the wrong ideas about who fancies whom. Meanwhile, Carlos, the hotel manager, receives an unwelcome visit from an old acquaintance, Cesar Rodriguez, who is after Mrs. Slocum, after seeing her passport. He is also plotting a revolutionary uprising and wants to use the hotel as his base. So a lot of farcical stuff happening there. Um, and, you know, just sounds like a lot of fun to me. You know, just that kind of mixed up notes and things, you know, goes back to old screwball comedies. And so I enjoy that kind of humor myself. Uh, comedy of errors. And this one, uh, new 2K scan, audio commentary by comedy historian Robert Ross and Gemma Fanning, on-set interviews with cast and writers Jeremy Lloyd and David Croft, Dutch television interview with John Inman featuring Wendy Richards from 1975, and Dutch television sketch with John Inman, Molly Sugden, and Wendy Richards from 76, audio interview with John Inman, Inman from 1976, isolated music and effects track on this one as well, and also another recreation of the press booklet included which is great so a beautiful set and one that I look forward to diving into and discovering all these films uh, so that's it for this wonderful round of releases from the wonderful folks at imprint films check them out uh, via the via vision website which I'll leave a 
link to in the notes below. And um, these are all region free. I should have said that at the top. These play fine in my region A player. Should be no issues with having a multi-region player for these releases from Imprint. And I haven't had any issues with any of their releases playing on my region A player. So just a heads up on that. Uh, anyway, thank you for watching and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.